Hello and welcome to the pediatrics lecture. We're going to cover a number of topics today specific to peds. A lot of the medications and conditions we've touched on in previous uh, adult medicine topics, but just to focus on a couple um, pediatric specific diseases and we'll bring back some infectious disease topics as well. Uh, but first, starting with some basic concepts of pediatric medicine. Um, definitions of ages, in case you're curious if I use the terms, you know, neonate or infant or child. And then talking about um, kinetics is really important with kids because it really does depend on how we dose medications. It's not just simply weight-based, and I'll get into that in a second. So uh, going through absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. So absorption, um, the, a few assumptions in children. Usually you have decreased gastric motility, decreased acid secretion, increased GI transit time, and increased percutaneous absorption. Uh, so kids are a lot more sensitive to certain things, um, especially like topical applications. And as a child gets older, these tend to normalize as they approach adolescence and get into adolescence, but um, especially when they're younger, it can be quite different. Protein binding, um, newborns have significantly decreased protein binding with um, lower levels of albumin, but um, the protein binding albumin levers, levels uh, normalize to adult um, similarity is around 7 to 12 years of age. And um, increased free drug levels in newborns and infants is going to be significantly higher than in an older child or an adult. So that's the big thing there. If you have a drug that's highly protein bound, like for example, phenytoin, um, if you're using it for child seizures, that would be a drug that you'd have to dose quite a bit differently than you would in an adult patient. Uh, free water changes. So this just the the only point of this is just to show the differences here between age groups and um, that the whole uh, distribution of medications is altered due to changing concentrations of total body water, extra, extracellular water, and body fat. Metabolism goes in, in waves depending on the age of the child. So with neonates, uh, hepatic enzyme activity is quite slow. Infants um, will start to ramp up during the first year of the life first year of life by the time they're one and through adolescence it's going to be very fast usually peaking in the toddler years but also continuing at a very high rate throughout adolescence it's not like it drops off after that usually doesn't slow down until um, sort of late a uh, late young adulthood if, if that's even a term i can use but probably in the mid-20s um, just like a lot of other processes in the body will start to slow down as we age but even then it stays quite high it won't really slow down an appreciable level until you know you're getting close to your elderly years, assuming your liver is healthy. Um, SIP oxidation and phase two conjugation are affected primarily. Um, so clearance again is very predictable in adult patients, but with children we just have to think about the different age groups. So for neonates, here's morphine as an example. Um, for neonates, your half-life of morphine is 7.6 hours. If you're one to three months old, it goes down a little bit to 6.2. By the time you're six months old, it almost drops in half to 2.9 hours. And then um, adults can range from two to four hours. So children are going to have a very fast hepatic metabolism. So that will affect also how frequently we dose medications in kids versus adults. Uh, changes in metabolic capacity. Just to continue this conversation, you can see the different enzymes and their activity throughout the years. Not super helpful because it doesn't have everything on here, but you can see certain things ramping up and uh, other things actually kind of dropping off a little bit. As far as elimination goes with renal function, it's usually related to gestational age at 23, or excuse me, 22 and 34 weeks being landmarks in kidney development. And so if a child is premature, that's going to significantly affect the kidneys depending on if they've hit those marks or not. Um, Otherwise, a term infant is going to have pretty high creatinine clearance. And the only thing different about kids is we don't use the standard like Cockcroft Galt or, um, MS or MDRD equations to calculate creatinine clearance. We're looking at something called the Schwartz equation, which is age-related constant, uses an age-related constant, looks at body length. 
And um, it's just because serum creatinine is not a super helpful marker in newborns. I think at certain, at some point, and maybe I have to check with the pediatrician or a pediatric pharmacist about this, but where, where they switch and eventually they do use Cockroft Galt. But I think for really little kids, like if you're working in a NICU or something like that, you're probably going to use the Schwartz equation. Um, what is more the gold standard with kids, though, is urine output. So measuring uh, weight of wet diapers or just simply um, if you have like a catheter and you can measure the direct urine output and that's going to give you a pretty exact representation of how functional those kidneys are. But that's not really doable in the outpatient setting, of course. Uh, from preterm to adolescence, you're looking at volume of distribution decreasing, creatinine clearance going up, and then again you can use the standard adult equations mostly for older kids and adolescents. And here's another example of just how um, anti, uh, how half-lives change over time. So gentamicin is basically a purely renally uh, eliminated medication, so it's a good marker to look at here. So with neonates, you've got a hugely variable uh, gentamicin half-life, and that is probably going to depend on how um, developed the child was at the time of birth. So were they premature or not? Obviously, a kid who's 32 weeks is going to be more on this 12 side, whereas a kid who is, you know, close to 40 weeks gestation is going to be closer to four. Um, child and adolescent, kidneys ramp up, you get uh, a much shorter half-life, and then adults can be in that range too, maybe expanding it a little bit as adults age. Kidneys don't process quite as well, but again, you're going to have to get into the elderly years to really start to see that for a healthy person. Uh, just a chart to show renal function and age, in case you're curious to see it visually here. So uh, one thing I'll say, I just went through all that pretty quickly. I would like you to know the basics. So specifically, like you think about a neonate when you're first born, things are slow, generally speaking. As you move into the childhood and adolescence, things are pretty high functioning and fast. And then as you move into adulthood, things taper off very slowly. Uh, so that's the big difference when you're looking at kids is neonate versus child, um, and that's where your metabolisms are going to be quite a bit different. The nice thing is is that um, we don't really have to think too hard about this, so while I, that's why I went through all this really quickly, because it's good to have a background on this, I think, but at the same time, um, when you're doing child medicine, you should definitely be using monographs and established dosing recommendations. So um, there's a lot of considerations taken into the dosing recommendations for medications with kids. And you know, on the surface level, you might just think, well, it's a smaller size person, so they get a smaller dose. And that's somewhat true. However, um, MIG per kg dosing takes into consideration some of these other factors too. So for example, like um, uh, here, I'll skip to this bottom point here. So if you have something, well, actually, that's not really what I'm talking about. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, rephrase that. What I would like to, to point out is that if you have some something that says like it's a 10 mg per kg dose for a child and you scale that up to an adult weight, so if you multiply that by like 70 or 100 kilos, you might get a much higher dose than you'd ever give an adult patient. Whereas with a kid, if you scaled it, relatively speaking, even though you're giving a smaller dose per milligram because their weight is smaller, if, again, if you multiplied that by an adult weight, it's actually a pretty high dose. So sometimes in kids, relatively speaking, we are giving pretty high doses uh, based on their body, but again, some of, based on their body weight. But some of that takes into consideration those metabolic differences and the faster metabolisms children have overall than an adult. Now, neonatal medicine gets a little bit different too because then you have to take those child recommendations and scale them differently. That's where dosing almost becomes an art form because there's not quite as much data on neonatal dosing like versus standard pediatric dosing. And a lot of stuff isn't even studied in neonates. So you rely on blood concentrations and levels and um, small studies and clinical evidence that way. Uh, so again, most kids' weight is mig per kg based. Um, and always be really careful, especially when dosing antibiotics, whether the recommended dose is mig per kg per dose or mig per kg per day. Uh, a lot of times they'll, they'll be interchangeable. Like you might be looking at one cephalosporin that says mig per kg per day. Um, a lot of them will we'll say like dose 25 to 50 mg per kg per day, divide in three to four doses throughout the day. Okay, so you have to think about what that means. So your total daily dose is 25 to 50 mg per kg per day. Your and then you take that dose and you divide it out by three or four or two or however many times they recommend doing the frequency. Others will say do 10 mg per kg per dose and dose 
X number of times per day. So it just is a little tricky. We, I've definitely seen providers and pharmacists actually get tripped up by this because it's it's confusing, especially if you don't work with peds very often. Um, my pro tip is always double check your kid's weight. So if you're ever doing any type of dosing, just make sure that it makes sense. Uh, certainly it's a really easy mistake for people to make entering something into the chart in pounds instead of kilograms or vice versa happens a lot. Uh, so like if I'm talking to a parent on the phone, I always double check with them what their kid's weight is if I'm following up with an antibiotic change or uh, an antibiotic dosing adjustment. Because um, I've definitely seen it before where um, the weight gets off and then you've got a, a reduction or an increase in weight that's pretty substantial actually. Um, if there's no recommendations of child dosing available and you really wanted to do a drug, this gets pretty advanced. Most stuff, most major conditions have drugs that have dose recommendations. But in this case, you can do the weight divided by 50 kilograms and then multiply that by the adult dose to get an approximate child dose. That's really easy. There's more complicated equations that can be used, uh, but that's a pretty basic, straightforward one. Uh, overall, studies in children are pretty lacking. There's a lot of ethical considerations. Um, however, the FDA has incentivized drug companies to do more pediatric testing in especially areas like mental health where a lot of antipsychotics and antidepressants get used very frequently with virtually zero evidence. Um, so the FDA has given drug companies added patent extension, like six months or a year of extra patent protection if they you know, produce some child literature. Um, growth and development effects on drug absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion can only be confirmed with studies. So without a study in that population, it's really difficult to understand if there's any pharmacokinetic nuances that we aren't aware of because again you can look at dosing as a you know a, a body weight reduction type thing because it's a smaller human but at the same time you have to take this stuff into consideration is it highly protein bound how is it metabolized is it renally excreted what population of children are using it and are using it in neonates or using it in um, uh, you know adolescents so it varies completely depending on what you're looking at uh, the current options, what's most commonly seen, is juvenile-related animal studies. So looking at looking at how the drug might metabolize in an adult animal versus a juvenile or child, well, child animal. That doesn't really make sense, right? <laughs> Let's just say juvenile animal. Um, Off-label use and safety reporting. Um, showing retrospective analysis. So let's say you start using phenytoin in children under two for seizure control, and you have you know 500 kids who have used it in your database. So you start to look at retrospective to see, you know, has it worked? Have you had to do dose increases? Or what have the blood concentrations responded like with different dosing? Things like that. Um, there's a lot of medications that don't have specific pediatric labeling by the FDA. Doesn't mean they can't be used. I like the albuterol example, that there's not actually an indication for children under four, yet albuterol is, you know, going to be used in infants or babies and to, to use for um, different types of airway issues, just like you would an adult patient. Adherence is usually left up to the parents. Um, children can be resistant or difficult to administer medications to. Uh, by the time they reach adolescence, they may be able to administer their own meds, but also probably need some oversight, at least, for, for the majority of, of people. Um, convenience. So uh, this is a big deal when it comes, because you're, you're not only relying on, it's not like with adult medicine where you kind of rely on one person to take care of themselves or maybe a caregiver, but in this case you're relying on, you know, the child, the adult taking care of the child and the child being resistant possibly to taking the medication. So there's a couple more variables at play with pediatrics. Uh, so less frequent administration times once daily if you can, dose forms that work for the patient. Um, for like kids that go to school, trying to dose outside of school hours so they don't have to worry about you know going to a, a nurse's office or something like that to use their inhaler. Um, taste of the medication, if it's a, a young kid and you're using like a pediatric uh, antibiotic suspension, something that tastes good, you might not know that specifically. Um, I did a class where we actually got to taste a bunch of different suspensions. And so that was kind of interesting. Um, but if you have any questions, you could always ask the pharmacist. Some pharmacies will actually flavor medications that are naturally not good tasting. Like, for example, clindamycin suspension tastes really bad. Um, penicillin suspension tastes bad. Amoxicillin, ceftonir taste better. So sometimes people will actually pick certain suspensions based on flavor.
Uh, and there are studies that show that physician or provider consistency helps with um, pediatric adherence as well. Oops. Oh, sorry, my slide got off here. Hmm, just a second. All right, I've got a couple slides on medications you should know as far as pediatric restriction. Generally speaking, most medications used in adults can be used in kids, but there are a few things to think about. So first, uh, this is sulfonamides or sulfa antibiotics. So Bactrim is a good example of this, sulf sulfamethoxazole. Um, use in infants less than two months is contraindicated. So you really only have to worry about this if you're working in neonatal medicine. Um, the ex exception would be if you had an HIV positive infant over a month, you could consider using it for um, pneumocystis prophylaxis, but that'd be really, really rare. Um, the risk is something called kernicterus, which is uh, a staining of and damage to brain tissue from unconjugated bilirubin. And uh, essentially it, it defeat, prevents the body's ability to process bilirubin correctly. So you end up getting high blood concentrations of it, which can um, cause brain damage and encephalopathy. Um, so that's the big risk there. And again, it's only for very, very small uh, babies. Um, tetracyclines, generally you want to avoid tetracyclines within the first eight years of life. So this involves doxycycline or tigacycline, more broad spectrum. If somebody's permanent teeth have all come in, you can probably safely use a tetracycline. However, if not, um, permanent teeth can become discolored. It's thought to relate to something with uh, tetracycline chelating to calcium in teeth. Uh, this is kind of a controversial one because there's some evidence out there that this actually has been used very safely in children under eight years. Uh, for example, things like Lyme or Rocky Mountain spot, Rocky Mountain spotty fever, spotty fever. I can't talk. Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, the preferred agent for that is doxycycline. So in some cases, um, it's recommended to, to go ahead and use that anyway, even though there is this potential risk. And in some of those kids they've looked at long term and really haven't seen this. So not entirely sure if this is uh, more of a myth or reality, but it does seem to be something that we generally try to avoid. So even if it is really rare or not necessarily proven, it seems like there's some technical evidence that applies here. So you should probably err on the safe side. Now, granted, if you have a patient who does have Lyme or Rocky Mountain or something like that, where Doxy is the first line, it certainly could be something worth consulting or considering, uh, but there is this inherent risk uh, of teeth staining. So that's one of the <clears throat> one of the ones to remember. Um, salicylate, so aspirin or Pepto Bismol or anything else with a uh, salicylate or salicylic acid moiety of some kind, um, recommended to avoid in all children and adolescents. The exception being low dose antiplatelet therapy for pediatrics with cardiovascular disease. There's something called um, Ray's syndrome, which is acute illness characterized by encephalopathy and fatty degeneration of the liver. You'll see elevated liver tests like ammonia and AST, ALT, super rare in adults, um, and onset is significant and um, seems to be in conjunction with pre-existing viral illness. Anyway, it's quite rare overall, but it's certainly much more high, uh, highly prevalent in children and adolescents than it is in adults and it's thought to be linked to aspirin. And this is something that's super rare, um, but overall it's recommended to avoid these in kids unless you have a really good reason to use them. Oh, also my slides back. And this is a little uh, funny rhyme you can read on your own if you want about some um, uh, government health publication about not taking aspirin if you're a teenager or something. <laughs> Again, quite quite rare overall. And then the last class would be fluoroquinolones, also controversial. So Cipro, Levofloxacin, and Moxifloxacin. And the recommendations are evolved around, if you can't remember from last fall when we talked about these, is joint and tendon issues. So they did studies on young beagles. I don't know why they use beagles. You'd have to ask a researcher on that one. Um, but they're given 100 meg per keg of Cipro daily for four weeks which ended up causing degenerative changes in the knee joint. Um, they saw minimal effects in the beagles at 30 mg per kg. Um, Leviquin and other fluoroquinolones have been shown to cause inflammatory arthritic lesions. Clinically, it's just really rare. For example, there is 
A observational study looking at 6,000 fluoroquinolone treated children showed the incidence was comparable with azithromycin, which actually doesn't have any document or doesn't have any um, age restrictions. We use that in kids all the time. Uh, so the question is, is this really big deal? Probably not. Um, I think the providers I work with get more concerned about elderly patients than, than peds with this, but it is a recommendation to generally avoid this if you can. However, there are illnesses that we'll, we'll want to use a, a fluoroquinolone in. So um, the, the other thing to point out is that the study parameters, they gave beagles 100 mg per kg, which is <clears throat> a ton of Cipro. So they basically overdosed the dogs with Cipro, and they gave it for four weeks. I mean, there's very little, if any, I mean, I can't really think of anything off the top of my head where you treat a pediatric patient for four weeks with a fluoroquinolone. So both the duration and the dose were way higher than what uh, you'd see in real life. And so that would be, you know, obviously if you overdose somebody, you're going to get more toxic results than if you treat them at a therapeutic level, um, staying within that therapeutic index. And in this case, they didn't do that. So the question, again, the controversy with this is, does this really matter when that study was one in dogs, not in humans, and two, we haven't really seen a replication in pediatrics uh, for this. So Okay, so now we're going to talk about a little bit about specific diseases. With neonates, most of the things uh, related to severe disease are going to be, um, well, there's some congenital things we're going to talk about, but also respiratory diseases are going to be the big one. Um, and that's because pulmonary development uh, needs as much time as possible to really fully develop. And if you don't get full gestation, so 36 weeks is sort of the benchmark where you have um, the most viable lung development if you're in even a little bit earlier there so like a 32 week pregnancy certainly that's very viable and we can do that but you're going to have some issues associated with that child uh, with that child's lungs very likely um, so you're just not getting optimal gas exchange and so development um, is just behind where a full-term infant would go. And even a full-term infant, their lung development is still going to develop, uh, continue to progress significantly over the next six months after delivery. So uh, this is where we're going to focus a couple discussion points. Um, something called respiratory distress syndrome is uh, the most common thing you're going to see in a premature infant. And it's due to just in immature lungs. And one of the things that happens with an immature lung is it doesn't produce pulmonary surf surfactant uh, like a mature lung would. And that's essentially just the lubrication in the lungs. Um, so during normal breathing process, it helps everything move correctly. And uh, if that's not in place, you end up with um, inflammation and ultimately pulmonary damage, which can cause uh, breathing disorders. And you can see the, uh, for, for example, a 28-week birth, 80%, 34 weeks, 25%, so quite a bit different. And then if we went up to 40 weeks, you'd probably see a very low percentage of that. Um, clinical presentation is listed there for you. Essentially, you have some basic respiratory symptoms worsening over the first couple days and developing pretty quickly after delivery. Prevention is uh, with most things that are caused by premature birth. We want to prevent deli delay delivery if we want, if we can possibly do that. So that goes back to the the previous lecture talking about perinatal. And then um, you can also give antenatal steroids, so something like dexamethasone or betamethasone can promote uh, lung cell prol proliferation. So if you have a mother who's going to be delivering or um, and the uh, gestational age is less than 35 weeks, they'll usually get an IM shot of betamethasone. It's a really common intervention. Treatment. Um, so you can give surfactant replacement. There's both synthetic and natural surfactants out there. Uh, diuretics can help too. So what happens uh, with the lung damage is you can also develop pulmonary edema. The diuretics will help remove some of that fluid. And we're using a loop diuretic in this case. You aren't really concerned about hemodynamics too much. You just want to get the fluid off. So that's why a loop diuretic is going to help. Um, nitric oxide is a gas that can be used as a pulmonary vasodilator. It's quite expensive, but it does reduce pulmonary hypertension um, and gives the lungs a chance. So if a kid ends up in the NICU because of something like this, they're probably going to be on some combination of these three as their primary treatment. 
Um, chronic lung disease is defined as oxygen requirement at 36 weeks gestation. It's sort of a continuation of RDS and um, possibly associated with abnormal chest rays as well, chest x-rays, excuse me. Higher association with low birth weight and uh, causes are similar to RDS. Complications are similar as well. Uh, prevention. Mention uh, vitamin A. Premature neonates have low blood concentrations, so that can help um, with lung development, supplementing that. Restricting fluid to prevent um, acute pulmonary edema, and again, surfactant. So putting on weight, loop diuretics. Um, if loop diuretics aren't cutting it, we can use thiazides synergistically. Remember, when we're trying to remove fluid, loops are always our primary treatment, and then thiazides like chlorothiazide or metolazone can be added uh, in addition as a synergistic option, but they aren't the primary driver. But just like with adults, it's basically the same treatment in kids. Bronchodilators, albuterol, ipratropium, nebulizers is going to be your standard thing, just like with most adults who have um, acute pulmonary disorders. Electrolyte replacement and glucocorticoids as well, possibly in severe cases. Um, apnea of prematurity is defined as a pause in breathing for more than 20 seconds or greater than 10 seconds with bradycardia with oxygen desaturation as well. Uh, again, low birth weight, premature gestational age associated with this, um, similar to chronic lung disease. Mechanism is listed there for you. This one, treatment is a little bit different. Um, sometimes it can be caused by underlying infections. So if your child has a pneumonia or if there is um, a cardiovascular related congenital issue. But we treat with uh, methyl xanthines. So methyl xanthines, we haven't really talked about too much. Um, but what methyl xanthines do is they are adenosine receptor antagonists on central GABA neurons. This prevents GABA release and GABA mediated respiratory depression. So it prevents some of the, the overworked uh, pathways in the central nervous system from causing a downstream effect that ultimately leads to, <clears throat> to uh, respiratory depression. So it helps the child breathe better. Um, the most common medications we're going to give are probably going to be caffeine. Um, aminophilin can be used as well. Um, caffeine, either IV or PO, is effective. It's got a wide, caffeine's preferred because it's got a wider therapeutic range, less frequent dosing, um, and it uh, is available in a couple different forms. Adverse effects involve, we probably all know what the adverse effects of caffeine are, and it's not going to be really any different in a kid. Tachycardia, jitteriness, GI-related uh, things like that, but generally pretty safe to use in children uh, for this particular indication. Neonatal infectious disease, usually most susceptible um, six weeks uh, from birth to six weeks after birth. Your body hasn't developed its natural killer cells. Um, until about 9 to 12 months, at least from a fully functional standpoint, and you're still getting immunity from all the new stuff your body is exposed to that you didn't pick up during development in your mother's womb. And certainly there are things like breastfeeding and stuff like that that can transfer antibodies as well. So there's lots of different ways you can get that, but the point is it takes time to build up um, both the innate and adaptive immunity um, that uh, us adults take for granted. Uh, T and B lymphocytes, again, develop around 15 to 19 weeks to station, they're, but they're, again, they're not very experienced at uh, counteracting threats. So our biggest concerns are going to be nosocomial bacteremia. So this would be stuff that you might find in the hospital, especially if your child is premature and they have respiratory disease. They might not have any infectious issues, but if they spend a week in the NICU, you know, the longer they are in the hospital, the longer that puts them at risk to, to encounter and get uh, infected by some nosocomial pathogen. Group B strep for mothers that are colonized and haven't gotten tested or treated properly. Uh, bacterial meningitis, fungal, and then viral infections um, if exposure is a risk. So HSV or HIV, obviously, if their mother is positive for either of those things, that would be a risk as well. So for bacteremias, again, our premature infants are at highest risk. The most common thing you're going to see is going to be group B strep. So again, that's something we can avoid with prophylaxis pretty easily, but it's possible to see it still. Um, things like E. coli and enterococcus, just because of the, the area of the birth canal, that can be a certainly affected. Uh, Listeria, H. influenza, and Staph aureus are the other ones we see commonly. Uh, treatment, 
pretty basic um, using ampicillin and gentamicin or vancomycin and gentamicin. Usually you're only going to use vancomycin in a kid just like you'd use it in adults. So really remember vancomycin is for MRSA and nothing else. So if you don't have MRSA, you aren't going to use vanco. But let's say you isolate some staph aureus, that's where you're going to do it. Um, with kids, aminoglycosides are still somewhat popular. Um, now, I think things have shifted a little bit to where people are using um, advanced generate, excuse me, advanced generation cephalosporins much more commonly. But if you do work in pediatric medicine, you might see aminoglycosides more commonly. And uh, you're going to treat empirically based on symptoms. So if somebody, if they have a fever right away after birth or signs of infection, that's where you're going to, to treat um, empirically with antibiotics and then do your blood cultures and things like that. Group B streps, again, colonized infected mothers, uh, leads to vertical transmission. Prematurity, male, and multiple births, all risk increases. Group B strep is strep agalactiae, and uh, it can cause uh, meningitis, bacteremia, cellulitis, and pneumonia. So you can see it in all different forms of uh, source locations. Treatment, basic penicillin works really good for group B strep, uh, or ampicillin works fine as well. We actually use ampicillin um, primarily. And you can give gentamicin. So for example, if you had a child with a bacteremia or any of these things really, um, and you, you, you're probably thinking group B strep's the most common cause, so my ampicillin or penicillin should cover whatever the child has, but it's probably group B strep, but if they don't have that and they have E. coli or something else, we want to make sure there's another drug on board that will help with that. And so that's why we often give some kind of gram-negative coverage until you can rule out uh, via culture. Um, clindamycin is a common alternative to penicillin allergic patients to treat group B strep. And you wouldn't really know that in a kid, but certainly you'd learn that pretty quickly if you administer ampicillin or penicillin to a young child and they have an allergic reaction right away. Dosing will depend on the source of an infection, so usually higher doses for bacteremias and meningitis, maybe slightly lower for uh, a pneumonia or a skin infection. Meningitis, so vertical transmission during labor, labor and delivery, again, is going to be the most common cause you see with this. And group B strep, E. coli, listeria, listeria uh, common presentations, and the drugs are basically the same as what we've already talked about. So for neonates, pretty much you're looking at ampicillin plus an aminoglycoside. Um, if you want to sub the aminoglycoside, you're probably going to look at some type of third generation cephalosporin, like cefotaxime is a really common one they use in kids. We don't use ceftriaxone quite as much in children, especially really young ones, because um, it can cause some biliary, biliary sludge buildup, which can lead to crinicterus as well. It's not as definitive uh, of a link as, say, um, sulfa drugs, but there is a risk there. So generally, you won't see ceftriaxone used in peds patients unless they're like over eight or some, somewhere in later childhood uh, or adolescence is when you'll start to see ceftriaxone more commonly used, um, where we use cefotaxime, which is essentially the exact same coverage as ceftriaxone. It's just dosed more frequently, so it's less convenient to use, but it really basically does the same thing. And then um, Vanco is going to be your choice if you have MRSA, just like in an adult patient. So really not much different than there. And the, the, one, the one probably big thing about treating a neonate versus an adult is we aren't as concerned about things like pseudomonas or really odd gram-negative bugs. Certainly you can see that kind of stuff. And if your child is in a hospital bed for a while, they could be more susceptible to nosocomial pathogens like that. But empirically, you're really looking at a very narrow set of bacteria that can be generally causing the infection. And group B strep, again, is going to be your primary source in about 50% of cases for and, and more for bacteremias and, and pneumonia. So really, your ampicillin is the workhorse here. You're adding on some gram-negative coverage to pick up your E. coli and your listeria, and that should cover everything quite well. In fact, well, I should say, just basically picking up the E. coli here, listeria would be covered by ampicillin as well. All right, fungal is going to be kind of rare, but um, opportunistic infections can certainly prey on a premature neonate that doesn't have an advanced immune system. Prophylaxis may be indicated. Usually we're using basic fluconazole, not necessarily getting into um, things like uh, caspofungin or e echinocandins or amphotericin. However, certainly 
you could see some more advanced pathogens there. Again, the longer you're in hospital, nosocomial pathogens and things like that, or if your severely child is severely immunocompromised, they could be more at risk to some of those uh, opportunistic, difficult to treat fungal infections. Um, genital HSV, vertical transmission, um, uh, especially if the child is immunocompromised, may cause local CNS or disseminated disease depending on the presentation, and we're going to use IBAs, acyclovir, just like we would in adult patients. For HIV, they can give um, zidavudine, which is an antiretroviral agent. They can give that pre intra and postpartum for six weeks, and it's pretty successful at preventing vertical transmission. So you give that to the, to the mother prior and during delivery, and then the child postpartum usually do it as like an oral suspension. And again, that's pretty prevent, um, successful. I think I was talking to George once about this, and he might have mentioned this in his lecture about HIV, that uh, I think Hennepin has had no cases of vertical transmission because of the protocols they use around zidabudine therapy. So if you, if you heavily suppress the virus during this process, it's a very little risk of transmitting it to the fetus, which is great. Uh, so uh, talking about a couple other neonatal things, patent ductus arteriosus is a pretty common thing if you work with neonates. Um, the ductus arteriosus is what diverts blood from, from the lungs of the fetus while they aren't being used. And um, large PDAs uh, post-delivery may lead to po poorly oxygenated blood available to the heart. Um, so if that gap doesn't close, then you still you have issues with circulation and getting blood oxygenated because things are mixing and that that shunting off like they should, or not, not being separated like they should, I should say. Um, a really small PDA probably is asymptomatic, probably unknown. You probably aren't going to see uh, symptoms. Well, obviously, asymptomatic means you won't see symptoms, but you probably wouldn't even know the child has it because it's small. It's going to close off uh, a little bit after, after delivery, and they probably won't ever have an issue with it. A large PDA um, can be treated with a couple of things. So if the infant's preterm, you can use an NSAID. Prostaglandins keep the ductus arteriosus patent or open. So by uh, suppressing prostaglandin activity, you can close it off. Um, otherwise, if it's large and that doesn't work, a surgery or a catheter procedure is going to be required to uh, physically go in there and close the, uh, the DA. Uh, necrotizing enterocolitis is a significant inflammation of intestine or colon, um, may lead to perforated bowel and ischemic bowel. Um, premature infants are at high risk for this, and antibiotics broad spectrum are used because, again, we're looking at GI flora, which shouldn't be as aggressive as an adult, but we do want to treat it much more broad spectrum due to not entirely knowing what, what could be the cause. Um, so that's pretty much it, and then you do supportive care, possibly surgical interventions if you need to. The moral of the story before we move on to the, the next set of um, diseases here is for neonates, you're looking at premature being the biggest risk factor. You're looking at infectious disease and respiratory being probably the two things to consider. Fortunately, it's pretty basic for both. I don't really care that you know a ton about the different respiratory diseases other than knowing you know, that some, some of the basics about um, surfactant production and replacing surfactant being a primary cause, and some of the basics around um, how we would treat infectious disease. So ampicillin, gentamicin, um, covering those group B streps and your basic gram-negative bugs. And then knowing what methyl xanthines are and uh, looking at um, strategies to, to combat um, lung disease, removing fluid with loop diuretics, uh, and using steroids in the cases they're indicated. Okay, moving on to pediatric infectious diseases. So if you didn't, if you're already getting a taste of ID that you don't remember, um, we go for quite a bit more, and we'll come back to ID again during the emergency medicine and critical care lecture. So it'll be quite a bit of ID, relatively speaking, to other topics this summer. So here's here we go. Uh, croup. Croup is an inflammation of the area just below the larynx, and it's commonly caused virally. Um, Mid-autumn, odd years, you see cases of croup, which is kind of interesting. Um, children usually seven months to three years. If you're over six, probably not going to see croup. Barking cough, inspiratory stridor, and hoarseness. You hear nurses a lot of times say, oh, that kid's got a croupy cough. That's a really common term. Um, I think once you hear it, you kind of remember what it sounds like. So it's sort of a unique sound. 
treatment, fluids, acetaminophen, cold humidifier, um, removing the child from any tobacco smoke or residual tobacco uh, can be difficult, but that can help as well. Usually the only thing we're treating, remember this is viral, so we aren't using any antibiotics, but dexamethasone uh, as a steroid, so that's 0.6 mg per kg PO, and um, we basically just take the IV product, mix it with a like applesauce or something like that, and have the kid eat it that way. There are some uh, different sol oral solutions available, but they're not quite as palpable for the child. You can also use uh, racemic epinephrine, the nebulizer, uh, to help with the uh, cause some vasoconstriction in the airway, and that can help open things up a little bit too. Um, usually used over something like albuterol in this case. It works better in the upper respiratory tract um, when you're trying to, again, cause some decreased inflammation in that area, whereas albuterol is going to work better in the lower respiratory tract. Uh, bronchiolitis is lower respiratory tract inflammation. It's usually caused by RSV, which is respiratory acetyl virus. And children less than two years, usually in the winter to spring months. It's the number one reason for infant hospitalization in the U.S. Usually you're looking at fever, tachypnea, tachycardia, and some other symptoms there. Treatment is generally supportive care and hydration. It's, again, viral, so you have to make sure the airway is uh, protected. But other than that, there's not a ton you can do. You can try racemic uh, epinephrine or racinephrine. Race <laughs> epinephrine is how some people say it. Um, hypertonic saline nubs can also help um, provide... It's like 3% saline usually, and it help provide some lubrication to the area. Glucocorticoids are generally not used, in a, so that's the big difference between this and croup. Um, in really severe cases, there's something called ribavirin, which is a nebulized antiviral agent that can be used, but it's um, going to be reserved for more advanced cases. Uh, prevention, if you have a kid who gets this, like, gotten has had this every couple years, or maybe if they have a... If they're born premature, they're going into RSV season. Um, it's a immune globulin that can prevent it from happening altogether, but it's really expensive. It actually helps build up your immune system so that you can attack the, the virus and not get a significant infection from it. I'm not sure how widely used this is. It's quite expensive, so I don't know if that's prohibitive or not. I imagine it is. Um, so I don't know. I've never, I don't personally work with peds very often, so I'm not too familiar with this, but I knew it is an option for some, some people out there. Pertussis is also known as whooping cough caused by the bacteria Bordetella pertussis. So you have ch kids that are less than six months old, not vaccinated. So once you have um, the vaccine sequence in place, which the first one is at six months, usually you see a, a pretty big drop. So you're going to see the, this take place in kids before they get that first vaccine or in kids who haven't been vaccinated. For adults and adolescents, or for, uh, yes, adults and adolescents, you can see waning immunity after that last um, sequence of vaccination. And so sometimes if you have a, you might see like an outbreak of adult pertussis. It is very infectious, uh, easily transmitted. And um, actually we had an episode in our ER, oh, this was probably like six years ago, where several providers actually got pertussis because, and uh, were being treated for it because as an adult, you don't really get exposed to it that often. And uh, it's something that you just, your immunity wanes over time. It's not really something we give boosters for, for adults. All right, for this particular disease, you end up with upper respiratory tract infection, symptoms, cough and stridor, usually not a fever, may lead to apnea, may lead to a pneumonia as well, but that's rare. And azithromycin is generally the treatment we're giving. Um, if the kid's over two months old, you could consider Bactrim as well. If the symptoms of uh, and cough have been established, the azithromycin won't really do anything to, to help eliminate the symptoms, but it will prevent uh, the spread of the disease to other people. So it's still generally recommended to treat. Uh, pneumonia, similar to bronchiolitis, more severe. Um, highest incidence of pediatric death worldwide is due to pneumonia. A couple vaccines that are helpful, the pneumococcal vaccine, H. influenza type B, and the general flu shot. Bugs that are common, group B strep, E. coli, listeria, sound familiar, right? Um, there are atypical pathogens that you're going to see usually later in life and viral pathogens as well. 
Uh, for viral pathogens, uh, for little kids, you're going to look at, for neonates, you're going to look at your uh, viral sources as uh, treating with acyclovir. Uh, gancyclovir, probably not, mostly encyclovir. Uh, for influenza, if you're over one, you can use Tamiflu, and that's going to be the primary treatment there. For bacterial community-acquired pneumonia, it depends on your age. And um, we already talked about neonates. It's going to be the same. We're going to cover our group B strep and our basic gram negatives. From one to six months, you're looking at um, probably a hospital admission, and then they're going to give something like a third-generation cephalosporin, so cefotaxime, and possibly azithromycin as well to cover atypicals. Um, six months to five years, usually atypicals aren't something that you see in kids as much, especially in kind of early childhood. You're probably looking at more um, strep pneumo, and so in that case, amoxicillin, ceftonir um, would be primarily what you're going to pick. Um, possibly with an IM dose of ceftriaxone on top. If you're inpatient, again, you're probably just doing the same thing. Azithromycin can be added to these patients to cover atypicals, but it's controversial and not thought to be extremely valuable. If you're over five years old, that's when they start adding um, atypical coverage. So you're looking at amoxicillin plus minus azithromycin, or interestingly enough, our controversial fluoroquinolones. And again, Respiratory fluoroquinolones work pretty well for pneumonia. That's probably one of their best uses is for a, um, uh, a pneumonia to cover atypical pathogens and then cover basically everything else that a pneumonia might cause. So in this case, um, if you have a kid with a severe pneumonia, it does make sense to do it and say, well, there's the tendon rupture risk. And you say, well, OK, the benefit of this drug outweighs that risk. Meningococcal disease. So. Um, Neisseria is going to be the leading cause here of bacterial meningitis worldwide, 10% fatality rate. Um, adults are often colonized with it. However, um, there's a lot of pediatric-specific diagnostic criteria, and essentially it's, it's not all that different than treating adults. You're starting antibiotic stat, you're getting vancomycin plus cefotaxi. Now, we did talk about a little bit different where we use ampicillin in little kids and probably not vancomycin, but other than that, for this is the exact same thing as you would treat an adult patient with, assuming they aren't elderly. Um, so it's not any different than that. Um, there is the vaccine that you start getting around 11 and 12 that is for Neisseria. So this is usually going to affect older um, children, if you want to cross for them, or adolescents, especially ones who have living, are living in group areas, so associated with college dorms, military, um, things like that. Urinary tract infection, uh, very common in, uh, um, in girls mostly. And uh, higher prevalence in boys under one year, though. So it's not super common in boys, but if the boy is uncircumcised, it's about eight to nine times higher, um, but overall still quite rare in a male child versus a female child. Um, UTIs, we think of in adults as being pretty easy to treat, pre pretty basic, might just go away on their own if you don't treat them. In kids, if you don't treat them, they can actually lead to pretty significant kidney damage. So it's important to treat them um, up front and, and be fairly aggressive with your treatment. You're looking at the same types of bugs you see in adults, uh, mostly E. coli, but maybe Enterococcus and Pseudomonas might show up as well. Uh, if the kid's under two, they probably won't have a specific presentation. They aren't going to tell you that they have dysuria or anything like that. So it just might sort of be their fussy eating or um, they might have a, a low-grade fever or something like that. Treatment. So if they're under two months old, probably going to admit for IV antibiotics. If they're over that should say under two months. Oh, sorry. This should say over two months, not under two months. If they're <laughs> anyway, there you go. Um, if they're over two months, you can maybe try uh, sending them home with oral therapy. Usually, we're going to go right to a third generation cephalosporin. Again, it's a little more serious than adults. So, with adults, we're willing to roll the dice and say, well, let's give you something that works for 90% of people out there. And if your culture comes back, and we can always change it. And kids were like, now let's just give you the advanced generation cephalosporin. It covers about 90% of E. coli, and um, you'll, be, you'll be all set there. We shouldn't really have to do any type of change of therapy. Hemolytic uremic syndrome is um, the most common cause of acute renal failure in kids under 10 years old, and it's caused by shiga or shiga-like toxin-producing bacteria. And this is associated with community outbreaks of E. coli. So E. coli, especially the 0157H7 or a STEC abbreviated E. coli, is the one that causes the hemorrhagic issues and produces this shigatoxin. Um, Shigella and Salmonella can also cause the same issue. 
Um, these are not normal flora in the GI tract, so they're usually, usually um, ingested from contaminated animal, animal products and can be tested for 15% uh, incidence if you're infected with it. 85% of people will resolve spontaneously in 10 days once the bacteria is cleared. Um, however, the toxins can still get into systemic circulation and cause damage to the kidneys. And kids are much more susceptible to this than adults. So with adults, we treat it seriously. With kids, we treat it extra seriously. There's not a ton to do with this. Here's just some more information about you. And it's mostly just supportive care, fluids, electrolytes, dialysis, if you really need to. Um, if the kidneys are already failing, um, you can dialyze uh, and hopefully dialyze some of the toxin off while you do that. Don't give antibiotics. Remember that lyses the, the cells and causes more toxin to be released. All right, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about vaccines. Kind of glossed over them last fall. Okay, so I think we all understand the basics of vaccines, but we'll just talk through it here. The purpose is to stimulate your active immune system to respond to a specific antigen. So a vaccine has to have something um, in in it that is native or, or mimicking the pathogen without actually being pathogenic. So that's what we call being antigenic, but not pathogenic. Goal, you develop some antibodies against this specific infectious pathogen without causing any harm to your patient. And vaccines are actually... Uh, well, in my opinion, they're very, very cool science. They're probably uh, accepted as, in addition to clean water supply, as being probably the largest public health initiative in preventative medicine that the world has ever seen. Um, we simply uh, almost eradicated illnesses with vaccination, and we certainly reduced incidence of several other types of illnesses substantially with vaccination. Um, if you're curious about vaccines, your schedules, literature, talking points, anything like that, um, the CDC has a lot of great resources on there, so I'll direct you guys to that. Uh, let's talk a little bit more detail about vaccines, though. So types of vaccines, you have attenuated live vaccine. These are treated to alter the pathogen. They can't induce the full, full disease, but they may cause some residual or mild symptoms. Usually because of this, we avoid them and people who are immunocompromised, so very young children, pregnant patients, and uh, people who might take immune, immunosuppressives or be on chemotherapy or something like that. Um, inactivated vaccines are organisms killed by heat or chemical. They're less effective than alive attenuated, but still used. There's toxoid, polysaccharides, surface antigen, lots of different kinds. I don't really care you know about any of the differences here. What I do care about is that you know the difference between alive attenuated, and then you can group all the rest of these sort of as other vaccines because um, they don't carry the same restrictions as live attenuated. And that's the really big thing to remember is live attenuated have restrictions for use in um, certain populations. The rest of them don't have those restrictions. Um, I'm not going to ask you any questions on an exam about vaccine schedule. You just look it up on CDC if you're curious as to you know what's there. there it's an example of one. Um, you have lots of different options on the CDC website for late starts and um, adult patients who have never been vaccinated, things like that, and how to do that. So they have lots of different scenarios that they'll go through. Uh, here's just an example of adults and what vaccines are recommended. OK, so I do want you to know the live vaccines. There are really only a couple of the ones that are used commonly. There are a few other live vaccines out there, but they, they really aren't used at all anymore, uh, or very rarely, I should say. Um, so the intranasal version of the influenza vaccine, the yearly flu shot, the flu mist, is live. So if you have a patient who really doesn't want their shot but wants intranasal, that's okay, but they have to be able to not meet the criteria of being pregnant, immunocompromised, etc. Um, zoster or Z herpes zoster or Zostavax, um, MMR, and varicella are all live vaccines. And again, those are going to be the commonly used live vaccines. There are a couple others, but those are the, the ones you'll see regularly used. Um, contraindications or precautions. So the biggest uh, risk is anaphylaxis, which is extremely unpredictable. Um, if your patient has an egg allergy, some vaccines use um, egg as a medium when they're being produced. So that can be something that you can uh, possibly filter out. So that's why you always have to say if you're allergic to eggs or not. But overall, you can't really predict anaphylaxis. That's sort of the, the whole concept there. So if you have an anaphylactic reaction, if you're giving vaccines, you just have to be prepared to deal with it. So having epinephrine handy um, 
for an IM injection is usually what's recommended. So like if, if a pharmacy, for example, a community pharmacy is giving vaccines like most of them do, they have to have this stuff on hand in case they do have an anaphylactic reaction in, uh, in, the, in the pharmacy itself. Immunodeficiency in pregnancy, um, again, avoid your live attenuated vaccines. If you're um, on immunosuppressive therapy, if it's short term, like a chemotherapy cycle, just hold off on vaccines until afterwards. Um, and the reason is not that you're going to hurt the patient because remember, this is not, so if you're considering a non-live attenuated vaccine, a regular vaccine, um, it's not that, you know, you're going to hurt the patient if you give it to them and they're immunosuppressed. Your immune system just isn't going to respond as well to that vaccine. So there's no point in giving it because you want the full response. You want to wait until afterwards. Acute illness. Um, so fever can actually mask the sign of an allergic reaction. So that's why generally it's not recommended if you have a fever to get a vaccine. And with your immune system already ramped up, um, you could get a potential attack on the particles designed to build immunity. Therefore, it sort of works against the, the system. So that's why if you're sick, you should, like if you have a, a seasonal influ a seasonal cold, wait until that's over to get your flu shot. Okay, so hopefully I'm preaching to the choir here, but in case you're wondering, there are people out there, and I think they're, at least I hope they are, in the, in the, in the vast minority of people out there, but I think they tend to be kind of a loud minority. Um, and certainly can get kind of toxic on social media. But there is a growing a group of people out there who just doesn't believe in vaccines. Regardless of evidence you give them or whatever, they probably aren't going to believe believe you or they're just going to choose to believe that vaccines are evil and cause all kinds of issues. Uh, vaccines don't really cause any issues in the general population. And again, the, the risks I talked about already are really it. So anaphylaxis and um, possible disease symptoms um, in immunocompromised people for live attenuated vaccines. Those are really the only two risks known with vaccines. There's nothing else that's been proven. Um, and specifically, autism was a big um, kind of rallying cry uh, several years ago. This has gotten debunked over and over again. If you're curious as to how this was started, uh, it was in 1998. Uh, gentleman by the name of Andrew Wakefield published a paper in The Lancet, which if you're familiar with The Lancet, it's a very widely respected medical journal. And why they published it, I'm not entirely sure because it was a really terrible study. But um, he did a sample size of 12 children um, and said that the MMR vaccine could ultimately lead to brain damaged brain tissue. Um, the Lancet ended up retracting the paper because they found that it was manipulated data, fraudulent research, and uh, Wakefield actually ended up, he was a, he's a British medical doctor at one point, and he was stripped of his medical license in the UK. And, and this triggered a whole chain reaction. There have been tons of money poured into various epidemiological comparisons and studies to back up these claims, and no one's ever been able to prove what he proved or what he, what his claims were originally. If you actually go and read his original paper, he didn't even really look at the MMR vaccine specifically. He more or less looked at an adjuvant and, and possible links to, to brain damage. Uh, so the whole thing was conjecture at best, in my opinion, after looking at it. Anyway, um, Wakefield continues to be sort of a rallying figure for the anti-vaccination movement. He seems to pop up at anti-vaccination conferences or supporting movies like the movie Vaxxed that, you know, was promoted and then withdrawn from a lot of film festivals a few years ago. Robert De Niro, I think, had his name on it and then back talked it off to try, <laughs> try and decrease some heat on himself. But um, the public health damage has been done, uh, and there, there certainly is a group of people out there who will forever hear stuff like this and read stuff like this um, from these anti-vaccination fringe movements based on uh, faulty evidence and, and a poor study um, that uh, that will, will not vaccinate or choose not to vaccinate their children or promote anti-vaccination ideology based on some of this stuff. And that's really unfortunate. Um, people tend to remember negative impact much more so than I can. I can give you a study of 12,000 kids who have been vaccinated with zero issues uh, beyond what we're seeing in the general population. And then you look at a, a sample size of 12 kids and you take that over that. So it's just the, the power of a negative story is pretty apparent in this whole thing. But again, I, I'm very hopeful in society. I tend to be an optimist, which may or may not be a good thing. <laughs> but I think that most people do tend to, to support vaccination. I think the anti-vaxxers tend to be a little bit of a fringe movement. And again, they just tend to be louder maybe than their pro-vaccination counterparts. Um, 
but you do have things like celebrities like Jenny McCarthy was kind of famous for um, leading sort of an anti-vaccination movement or at least promoting an anti-vaccination agenda of sorts. Um, even though she's kind of said she isn't, she's still it, it's like it's a very fine line to walk once you start questioning certain things that you don't really understand uh, and you have a, a platform like that, you end up causing a lot of harm, even if that's not necessarily your intention. Um, one of the things that's come up a lot is something called thimerosal, which is a mercury-based preservative um, considered by vaccine critics as a neurotoxic culprit. So mercury is neurotoxic. Um, however, there's a lot of studies that actually have shown that there isn't really any link between thimerosal and autism. So why exactly is thimerosal in the vaccines? Well, again, it's a preservative. So you're going to see it in multi-dose vaccines. Uh, a good example of this is the yearly flu shot. If you get a flu shot, like um, for example, at our hospital, we, when we do flu shots, we're using the individual ones. Those individual doses don't have preservative in them, um, so you don't have any worry about um, uh, thimerosal at all. And uh, the only time you're ever going to see thim thimerosal is in like a multi-dose vial. So if you have a flu vaccine vial where there's 10 injections in one vial, one mil each, 10 mil vial, that's where you'll see a preservative. Um, but in any case, um, there's been studies that show that there's no real link between people who've gotten thimerosal. And actually, thimerosal um, has never been uh, in MMR, which I think is a really funny thing, because if you go back to this study, it just makes even less sense. And um, thimerosal actually was moved from most vaccines completely. So vaccine companies were like, all right, well, we don't really need this in our non to to preserve single dose vaccines, so we'll just stop using it altogether, avoid the controversy, and be on our way. And so again, there's still some multi-dose vial exceptions where thimerosal is used, but vast majority of vaccines don't carry any thimerosal in them. So there's that. I could go on and on about thimerosal and mercury and the different types of mercury and how ingesting mercury, you probably expose yourself to more mercury than you do over a lifetime of vaccines, but <laughs> that just gets into the weeds. And ultimately, it's a small amount of mercury, if anything, and there hasn't been any evidence to show that it's neurotoxic in that particular form that exists as thimerosal. Some other uh, public health concerns that you might hear, or just as a provider, you might hear patients. I don't think people mean wrong but and, I, and believe me i don't believe there's anything wrong with saying you know what what about giving too many vaccines at once especially when you hear some politicians even say stuff like this uh you're like you might think especially if you aren't scientifically educated or don't really know much about vaccines like probably the, the vast majority of people out there you might think to yourself well is there really a risk with this and who are they going to go to well they're going to ask their provider about this which is what what they should be doing so um, just to talk about some of these concerns here uh, most people are again i think are rational and will will listen um to to um to a well-presented argument but anyway um, vaccine overload is something that's come up and the concern here is that the immune system becomes weakened and overwhelmed if you give a bunch of vaccines at the same time so, or that by giving a lot of vaccines in a short period of time, you increase the risk of anaphylaxis. So a guy named Robert Sears published a book a while ago that um, that was one of his big points is that uh, one of your biggest risks of vaccination is anaphylaxis. So if you give somebody six vaccinations in one sitting versus four this month and three the next month, you're going to, uh, you're going to increase the risk of having anaphylaxis. Um, that hasn't been shown to, to actually be true. So just so we're clear on that. A uh, case was that settled with the CDC and something called the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program for a girl whose encephalopathy worsened um, following administration of multiple vaccines. Vaccine Injury Compensation Program is a program that the government has for people who have had bad reactions to a vaccine. So it does happen. And I think the government realizes that you know, you're giving these to children. A lot of times the child has had no exposure to what's in the vaccine before. So there is that risk of anaphylaxis or, or something more serious happen. Again, it's quite rare, uh, but that's why the compensation program exists to, to um, reimburse people for illness or issues caused by vaccination. So what about vaccine overload? Um, the interesting thing about an infant immune system, if you think about it, is that we, we can't really calculate how many things a, a child is being exposed to constantly, but it's a lot. And being exposed to the environment, there are probably thousands of environmental uh, in exposures and things your, your immune system is picking up on and adapting to in the early phases of life that makes vaccination probably... 
um, a, a minor point in there, but again, that's very hard to prove because we don't really know. Uh, but the immune system is designed to expose, to, to react to a number of different threats and build immunity and adapt to immunity of a number of different threats at one time. So combining vaccines during a visit doesn't really change how the immune system responds or shouldn't. Um, the amount of immunogenic material in vaccines has also decreased substantially over time. So we're using lower doses, technically, if you want to look at it that way, than we used to in the past. Um, so one of the recommendations for this, uh, to, to alleviate this problem, I'll use air quotes there, is that you don't have, uh, or that um, you want to spread out the vaccine schedule, because if you do that, then you reduce some of these risks. Well, first of all, there's zero evidence that um, the current vaccine schedule poses any type of problem or health concern. There's no evidence that it overwhelms the immune system. There's no evidence it increases anaphylaxis. There's just no evidence for anything. So Robert Sears proposed this um, alternate schedule in his book to um, address this problem he invented. I mean, he's coming up with a problem that just simply doesn't exist. There's no evidence it exists. And he's proposing a solution to fix a problem that doesn't exist, which in my opinion is a, a pretty significant error on his part. Um, the danger here is that if you delay a vaccine by a month, two months, three months, a year, uh, that's months where the child could get exposed to something where otherwise they could have been building immunity to it the whole time. And is the risk low? Probably, yeah, but it's still a risk. And I would not take that personally with my children. And I don't think anyone should really be playing games with infectious disease, especially in this day and age. Um, aluminum concern. There's other thing about, well, don't vaccines contain aluminum? Some do use aluminum to uh, bolster immune response. However, it's thought to be a relatively small amount of aluminum and that infants will ultimately ingest more aluminum from dietary sources than they'll get through aluminum um, via injection. And ultimately, it's thought to be quite safe. And um, aluminum is neurotoxic in really high doses, but it's not thought to really affect children uh, outstandingly. All right. What about big pharma? Uh, big Pharma just makes vaccines to make money. They're they're just a big scam by the government, or you know some, something like that. Um, sure, vaccines are profitable. A company wouldn't make them if it, they weren't making some money off of it. Uh, but vaccines are actually really expensive to produce, and the profit margins are much slimmer than like a once daily PO medication. There's actually only one or two companies that make vaccines. Merck's one of the big one. Um, I think Novartis might make some. But there's not a lot of pharma companies actually in the vaccine game for the reason that I just said, that they're just there's not a lot of money to be made. R and D is really expensive compared to standard drugs. And vaccine production is more expensive. Um, but if we look at it in the grand scheme of things, if you actually some people have done economic models, and I'm not going to go into all the numbers, but if you think about how many diseases we've prevented with vaccination and how much that would cost the healthcare system and hospital bills and things like that. We're probably saving billions and billions of dollars uh, by spending a couple hundred bucks up front with a vaccine, which most insurances pay for, and you've got a lot of savings and, and life expectancy increases because of that. So the, the cost benefit is not is negligible. There's there's no there's no comparison really to what, what you're likely saving based on the small expense of vaccine costs. So for me um, worth it. And again, most insurances, or even if you have state insurance, and if you're on Medicaid or Minnesota state insurance, um, you might, you're probably, you're still getting it all covered. So there's lots of options out there for people with limited resources as well. Uh, here's an uh, example I like to give about Haemophilus influenzae type B. So prior to immun immunizations, uh, this was a leading cause of bacterial meningitis and bacterial disease in general for children less than five. Uh, there was one in 200 children would develop invasive HIV. It, it was 66% in children under eight, uh, 18 months. Um, and certainly a significant mortality rate, especially with meningitis. Vaccine was developed in the late, I should say in the late 18, or sorry, 1980s. And the CD, CD reporting started in 1991 officially. Um, the early uh, 1980s incidence estimates are about 20,000 cases per year and average cases are about 2,500 per year in recent times. And out of those, only about 400 involve children under age five. So the vast majority of cases are probably in older kids or adults, probably haven't gotten vaccinated or have waning immunity over time. 
and we're really seeing much, much less um, cases in kids. Basically, it's been eliminated. It's very rare to see this in a child who is fully vaccinated and not immunocompromised. And again, this is one of those examples where if you delay this, you, you increase your child's risk substantially of contracting it because it is so common in really young kids. If you say, well, I'm not going to do this at the six month visit. I'm going to follow Sears book and do it eight months or a year or whatever he says to do it later, um, then you risk that. That's uh, a huge window of time potentially where you're exposing your kid to something where you don't necessarily have to. And that's, that's a, a big problem, I think. All right, herd immunity, what is it? And protecting those most vulnerable. I think in the COVID era, we're seeing this become a much more common talking point. But I think before that, it's a little confusing. People don't necessarily totally understand vaccination. People say, well, it's my choice to get vaccinated. If you want to get vaccinated to protect yourself, great, but I'm, I'm good without it. Well, it's not really an okay mindset. <laughs> that's a very selfish mindset. Um, and that's because of herd immunity. So the, the whole concept of herd immunity is we need to protect the most vulnerable of our population. So um, some people call this com community immunity, but I think it's really commonly referred to as herd immunity. So if we vaccinate the most people out there, um, they will isolate uh, transmission of the disease to our most vulnerable people. So the disease can't spread easily if it can't find hosts. So let's say if you have a room full of 100 people, 90 of them are vaccinated, 10 aren't. It's very difficult for a virus to move around there and to find those 10 people that aren't. Whereas if you have you know, 20 people who are vaccinated and 80 that aren't, then you have a lot of easy transmission points there. So when herd immunity fails is when healthy people decide they, they want to rely on herd immunity. Uh, that's not appropriate. The healthy people need to get the vaccines, need to Im immunize themselves so that they don't transmit the virus to other people. And those who are those other people? They're immunocompromised patients. They're the kids who have cancer who are too immunocompromised to get the MMR vaccine. They're a pregnant population who maybe can't get a vaccine. They are our, um, uh, a transplant population. Yada, yada, yada. You guys get the point. Uh, the, the issue here is that um, just to say that, well, I'm healthy. I don't need that vaccine because of herd immunity. That's the wrong mindset. Your mindset should be like, I'm healthy. I get the vaccine. Therefore, I protect people. It's kind of like wearing a mask in public for, for COVID, right? You're, you're wearing a mask to prevent yourself from asymptomatically spreading COVID if you have it and you don't know it, whereas you aren't really protecting yourself by wearing a mask as much. Um, so I think that just this concept is very similar and it's about um, doing the best thing for our population as a whole, not doing the best thing for you as a person, even if that's where your mindset is. You need to think about the, the grand scheme of things a little bit more. So that's my herd immunity soapbox for a second there. Okay, let's talk about a couple more things. Um, pediatric cardiovascular disease. Uh, I don't care you know a ton about this because it's very specialized, and I don't know if anyone plans on working in this area, but certainly um, it's not all that much different than adult heart failure, really, when it comes down to it. There's a lot of different things that can happen to a kid, and I'm not going to test you on any of this stuff. Most of these things involve surgery. There's a lot of different um, pathologies that can, that can come about with congenital heart disease. Essentially, what we're looking at is, again, very similar to what we treat adults with. You're looking at inotropic things like milrinone. We don't use that quite as much in adults, but we do sometimes. It's a very common inotrope to give kids. Um, we use things like IV dopamine, epinephrine. We use things like sodium nitroprusside to increase or, excuse me, decrease pre and after load to, to vasodilate. So similar to how we'd use them in adults. Fluids, um, post-surgery wound prophylaxis, so like things like cefazolin prophylaxing against basic skin pathogens, um, diuresis for fluids, just like we talked about with the respiratory stuff, using loop diuretics there. Same same kind of stuff here. Heart failure, treated very similarly to adults. You're looking at um, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, diuretics, uh, possible digoxin. So uh, again, it's not um, really going to be different. The only the, probably the biggest difference with kids is you're going to see beta blockers used less frequently and um, more only more for severe cases. So they usually just get by with the ACE inhibitor and a diuretic and maybe digoxin for some symptomatic relief, whereas beta blockers aren't as commonly used in kids, whereas, you know, with adults, they're a, a foundational aspect of CHF. Arrhythmias don't have much to say. We'll talk about ACLS. 
during um, during the emergency medicine lecture briefly, but basically there's a PALS component to this, and it's really similar from a to adult medicine. You just dose things differently, and it's more um, pediatric emergency stuff is much more respiratory driven. So a respiratory emergency may lead to a cardiovascular emergency, whereas with adults you more see like a, a direct cardiovascular issue, like a an a STEMI or something like that, lead to an arrhythmia. Hypertension wasn't very common for many decades, and now with kids, we're seeing it more common just due to rising obesity rates in children. Um, dietary habits, activity levels are really important targets, so making sure kids get outside and play or play inside or whatever they're doing um, to, to, to stay active. Um, <clears throat> Staging, um, it's a little bit different than adults. Usually you're looking at um, percentage-wise based on age group or generally speaking if it's over 120 over 80 uh, for adolescents that would be considered prehypertension and then it goes up from there. Treatments, basically the exact same thing as adult medicine so I'm not going to go through there. Nothing you can't use in an adolescent or a young child patient that you can use in an adult. Pulmonary hypertension, uh, I'm not going to go through this because it gets I'm not going to test you on this, I should say. Um, it gets complicated, but um, usually this is due to some sort of effect from the newborn, so having um, premature lungs or some sort of a cardiology-related complication. And treatment is listed there. Again, it's pretty much the same as what we, what we use in adult patients. All right, there's cardiology blown through. Um, other PEDS topics, let's talk about some other things very generally speaking, just to cover our bases. You've got general pain management. Um, basically, you treat pain almost identically to how you treat adult pain. You need to routinely assess it, treat it appropriately. Don't assume kids are less resilient to pain or um, don't have memory of pain or become easily addicted to narcotics. Those aren't reasons to avoid treating pain in kids. Um, we want to use specific pain scales for, pediatric, for pediatrics, uh, but basically it's the exact same as adults. Here's some examples. Uh, as far as acetaminophen and ibuprofen dosing, just being in healthcare, I'd recommend memorizing this because you're going to get family members and people asking you about this all the time. Oh, my kid's got a fever. What should I give them um, to know how to dose it? Opioids, again, they're all pretty much okay. CF, I'll spend a couple slides on CF just because it's sort of an interesting disease and some stuff we haven't really talked about uh, previously. Um, cystic fibrosis, uh, mutation on the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. Essentially, you end up with these productions of really thick viscous secretion because you have a chloride channel that's not regulating itself properly. And these secretions build up in the lungs, pancreas, liver, intestines, and reproductive tract and cause multi-system organ damage. Um, so as you can imagine, with all those areas affected, uh, cystic fibrosis patients have quite a few complications that come up. The pulmonary issues are the big ones, and that's going to be what ultimately um, reduces their life expectancy. It's a autosomal recessive disease, so if you have a carrier in your family, you, you know there is that risk that you could pass it on to your child. Um, the mean life expectancy of a cystic fibrosis patient is going up, but it's about 40 years, and it can depend on the treatment center as well. There are actually some new treatments for cystic fibrosis out there. Uh, some of these were just approved as early as last year, um, and I'm not going to go through the names. One of the brand names that I know for sure is called Trikopta, which is a triple therapy. And essentially what these drugs are looking at is directly modulating um, the way that the receptor regulator that's deficient is getting produced and being available. Um, they're new. They're quite expensive. Um, as you might imagine, it's very limited amounts of people that can apply for this. And there's also genetic limitations, too. So you might have to have a certain gene um, expressed that will work for these new medications. But they are showing kind of groundbreaking differences in how you can manage cystic fibrosis. Instead of what we're doing right now is really just managing the, the complications and symptoms of the disease. So treating the lungs and treating the, the pancreas deficiencies, this will actually work directly to, to modulate how the body is um, using this CFTR uh, protein and making sure that you're not getting a mutated one, but a correctly producing one that'll um, reduce the risk of these thick secretions that are coming out. So I think there'll be some cool stuff uh, in addition to these early drugs that are, that are new, and I don't really understand 
their place in therapy. And again, cystic fibrosis, advanced treatment is kind of out of scope for this class, I think. I don't think many of us will end up in that field, but certainly if you work in advanced pediatrics or pediatrics in general, you'll see CF patients, and you're probably going to see these drugs start to get uh, more and more available. So again, I don't have a slide on them right now, but I thought it might be interesting to mention that there are some some what people are considering kind of groundbreaking CF treatments. And that's really cool because again, right now there's, it's a very intensive disease to manage. There's not a lot of um, significant uh, uh, groundbreaking therapies that have been done in the last you know few decades until recently we're seeing some of these new drugs come out. So anyway, some cool stuff there. Uh, but let's talk about some of the other things that a cystic fibrosis patient will have to treat. So these are sort of the areas that are affected and what can, can be um, seen on the patient. So uh, infertility issues, um, uh, pancreatic enzyme production re reduction. So you end up having to supplement enzyme uh, to help metabolize things like uh, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And then you have um, uh, clogged airways, which causes respiratory inflammation and infection. Here's just the genetic component. Yeah, we probably all did this in ninth grade biology or something, right? Um, cystic fibrosis treatment. So with the pancreas involvement, I just talked about what that means. You're essentially replacing enzymes. I don't think I've talked about these before, but there are a couple of products on the market that are pancreatic enzyme replacement supplements. People with um, pancreatic cancer or pancreatitis chronically might use these as well. But um, I think of them kind of as a cystic fibrosis drug. But certainly, you know, if you're like a chronic alcoholic with chronic pancreatitis, you, you might see these used more commonly in the general population. Um, Creon and Zenpep are two different ones. And again, they contain amylase, protease, and lipase. So you can dissolve all of your or digest all your um, uh, macronutrients correctly. And the um, the um, Doses vary substantially depending on the different ones, so you can really titrate to being. So people basically take these with each meal. They'll take a few capsules with each meal or snack. Um, diabetes is is common, and due to uh, basically a diabetes, excuse me, a DM1 type presentation, you end up with pancreatic failure over time. So you need to supplement with insulin. Some other GI involvement seen there. Pulmonary involvement is the biggest one, so you have obstruction, inflammation, and infection, and um, what you're trying to do is uh, improve secretion clearance and prevent infections. So uh, one of the major mainstays of CF therapy for a long time has been percuss percussive therapy, which is basically wearing a pneumatic vest that pumps on the chest and loosens secretions. At the same time, you're usually using a bronchodilator to help open up the airways and um, using a, something called Pulmozyme, which is Dornase Alpha. It's a drug that's biologic, and it cleaves polymerized DNA found in CF mucus and reduces viscosity. Because between all these nebulizer treatments and the percussion, you kind of suction or cough up the secretions, and that can help keep your lungs clear. Most CF patients do that a couple of times a day. And here's an example of what the percussion vests look like. So you've got your percussion vest on, looks like a life jacket with some pneumatic tubes attached to it, and then you've got your um, your nebulizer usually going at the same time. Steroids and antimicrobials are going to be used as needed depending on the severity of the respiratory illness. Um, usually with antimicrobials, one thing about CF it's because you have these reservoirs of thick mucus, bacteria like to live in them, and you get really odd bugs in these patients, and you can get infections that are extremely resistant and difficult to treat. Uh, so one way to treat those, besides broad-spectrum antibiotics, is sometimes using a chronic suppressive therapy, so either daily uh, azithromycin is used sometimes. Also, um, there is a tobramycin nebulizer solution that can be inhaled alongside the other neb treatments. Uh, moving on to sickle cell disease, this is a not necessarily a pediatric illness, but certainly you'll see it in PEDS patients. So you get sickle-shaped red blood cells. Uh, they get stuck places, like especially microvasculature, so you get complications that involve significant pain in the hands and the feet, and also things um, like infections, um, possibly pulmonary. Uh, in males, you can get priapism and uh, possible end organ damage over time. In case you want to see the picture. Uh, I'm not going to go through this too much because I don't really care you know the treatment. 
essentially this kind of looks like a pneumonia for some patients. So you might treat it with antibiotics, but there might be other factors involved here too. Not might necessarily be purely infectious. And then there's a bunch of other things I put down here. A lot of times what you might have to do is um, do some kind of a transfusion actually to remove the sickle cells and uh, replace them with regular blood cells. Um, hydroxyurea is a medication that uh, can be used as a um, drug that al will alter red blood cell function and it actually can prophylax against sickle cell uh, complications. So sometimes you'll see, if you see a patient on chronic hydroxyurea, they're probably on it because of sickle cell disease. Um, neuro and pediatric psych is basically the same as adult. We're using almost all the same drugs. And um, we kind of, I mentioned this a little bit during those topics. I'm not gonna go back to it. I just wanted to revisit it to get a full review of systems, but there's really nothing different that we do in, in adults that we don't do in pediatric patients. Just different doses, less evidence, maybe different evidence. Maybe like, for example, in adults, all SSRIs have been fairly well studied and pediatrics only some of them have been. So just a, specific populations may have better data for certain drugs, but they all probably are useful and all used in different uh, cases. So that's it.